Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, Escape to Storyland. Today I'm back again with another story and this time it's a psycho thriller called The Doll Master by Joyce Carol Oates. But before I start, do subscribe to my channel, do hit the like button and the bell icon for further notification. So let's go. You can hold her but don't drop her. Amy, my little cousin, held out her beloved doll to me and said this with a smile on her face. It was a baby doll in baby clothes, a little top adorned with pink baby ducklings and on the tiny baby doll feet little pink boots. It also had a baby diaper, white with a silver safety pin. A soft fleshy baby doll with a calm baby face, soft baby fingers and fleshy little baby arms and legs that could be manipulated to a degree. The baby hair was fine and blonde and curly and the baby eyes were slate blue marble that opened and closed as you tilted the doll backwards or forwards. There is a scary ticklish sensation you feel when you see a baby close up because you think that the baby could be hurt. And this is how I felt about baby Emily. Though she was only a doll, my cousin Amy was three years old, which was younger than my age by 11 months. This is what we were told. A birthday is an important event in our family, our parents said. Amy was the daughter of my mother's younger sister, who was my aunt Jill. So mommy explained Amy was my cousin. I was a little jealous sometimes. Amy could talk better than I could and adults liked to talk to her marveling at her speech skills, which made me feel bad for nobody marveled at me. Amy was a little girl, shorter than me, smaller all over than me. It was strange to see such a small child as Amy clutching a baby doll according to the friends of our mothers, fussing and fretting over baby Emily as Amy's mother fussed and fretted over her, even pretending to nurse baby Emily with a tiny baby bottle filled with milk and changing baby Emily's diaper. Between her fleshy baby legs, baby Emily was smooth. There was no way for baby Emily to soil her diaper. I did not remember ever soiling my diaper. I do not remember now. I am inclined to think that as a baby boy, I did not have to wear a diaper. But that is probably inaccurate and irrational. For I was a fully normal infant, I am sure. If there were accidents in the night, especially in my PJs, as my mother called them, I do not remember. I do not remember nursing either. I think that I was nursed from a bottle. All this is a very long time ago. It's natural not to remember. You can hold her, but don't drop her. These were Amy's words, which I do remember. They were an echo of an adult mother's words, which you often hear. It was a terrible surprise in the family when Amy passed away. At first, they said that Amy was going to the clinic for tests. Then, they said that Amy would be in the hospital for a few days. Then, they said that Amy would not be coming home from the hospital. In all these time, I was not taken to the hospital to see Amy. 
I was told that my cousin would be home soon. You can see her then, sweetie. That will be soon enough. Or your cousin is very tired right now. Your cousin needs to sleep and rest and get strong again. Afterwards, I would learn that it was a rare blood sickness my cousin had. It was a kind of leukemia and very fast acting in young children. When they said that Amy would not be coming home, I did not say anything. I did not ask any questions. I did not cry. I was stone-faced. I overheard my aunt saying to my mother, I wondered if to be stone-faced was a bad thing or a good thing. For then, people let you alone. If you cried, they tried to comfort you. But if you were stone-faced, they would leave you alone. It was around this time that I stole baby Emily out of Amy's room. We were often at my aunt's house. And while my mother and my aunt were crying together, I went to Amy's room and lifted baby Emily from my cousin's bed, where the doll was lying with other less interesting doll and stuffed dolls, as if someone had flung them down and had not even made up the bed properly. I did not think that my parents knew that I had stolen baby Emily inside my jacket and brought her home with me. But later, I would realize that probably they knew, as my aunt knew, and did not say anything to me. They did not discipline me. Talk was all of Amy for a long time. If you entered a room and adults were speaking in lowered voices, they would cease at once. Bright adult faces turned towards you. Hello, Robbie. I was too young to consider whether such a rare blood sickness might be genetic, that is, carried in the blood from one generation to the next. When I was older, I would research leukemia on the internet, but still, I would not know. When I was alone with baby Emily, we cried because we missed Amy. I did not cry because Amy was dead, only because Amy was gone. But I had Amy's baby doll. I snuggled with baby Emily in my bed and that made me feel better, a little. When I was five years old and going to preschool, baby Emily disappeared from my room. I was so surprised. I looked under the bed and in the closet and in each of my closet drawers. And then I looked in all these places again, as well as beneath the covers at the foot of the bed. But baby Emily was gone. I ran to my mother, crying. I asked my mother where baby Emily was, for there was no secret about my cousin's doll baby now. My mother told me that my father didn't think it was a good idea for me to be playing with a doll at my age. Dolls are for girls, she said, not boys. Daddy just thought it would be much better to take the doll away before you got too attached. Guiltily, my mother spoke and there was a softness in her voice. But nothing I said could change her mind. No matter how I cried or how angry I became, slapping and kicking at her and saying how I hated her, my mother did not change her mind because my father would not allow it. He said he had indulged you long enough and he blames me in place of baby Emily, who was so sweet and soft and smelt of foam rubber, my father had instructed my mother to buy me an action toy, 
one of the new model expensive ones a US Navy SEAL robot soldier that came fully armed and could move forward across the room empowered by a battery I would never forgive either of them I thought but particularly I would never forgive him The first of the found dogs was Marishka Take her but don't drop her My friend spoke quietly urgently glancing about to see if anybody was watching Many times I would walk to school and home from school avoiding the school bus where the older boys would taunt me my family's house was at top of prospect hill above the city and looking towards the river which was often dreaded in mist the middle school was about a mile down the hill along a route that i had come to memorize often i took shortcuts through alleys and across backyards where i moved swiftly with the pace of a wild creature This street was catamount with a narrow lane that ran parallel behind it past six foot wooden fences beginning to rot trash cans and piles of debris my friend said never make eye contact that way they don't see you either no one ever saw me for i moved quickly and furtively and if they saw me at a distance They saw only a boy, a young boy with a blurred face. My friend was very tall, taller than my father. I had never looked directly at my friend, who forbade it. But I had a sense that my friend had features sharp and cunning as a fox, and his natural way of moving was agile as a fox. And so I had to half run. to keep up with my friend who was inclined to impatience take her no one is watching marishka was a beautiful ceramic doll very different from baby emily marishka had creamy ceramic skin and on her cheeks two patches of rouge she was dressed in a drindal costume of an eastern european peasant white blouse full skirt and apron white cotton stockings and boots her blonde hair was braided into two plaits and she had a rosebud mouth and blue eyes with thick blonde lashes it was strange to touch marishka's skin which was a hard and unyielding ceramic skin except where it had been cracked and broken Marishka's arms were outspread in surprise that such a pretty dressed blonde girl with pleated hair and blue eyes could be allowed to topple from a porch railing into the mud her hair soiled her skirt soiled and torn and the white stockings filthy and her legs were at an odd angle to one another as if the left had been twisted at the hip walking with my friend along the lane behind catamount street and between the rooted broads of a fence we saw marishka my friend gripped my hand so tight that my bones hurt she is our prize she is the one we have been waiting for hurry take her no one will see It was a thundery dark afternoon. I was shivering with cold or with excitement. For my friend had appeared walking beside me with no warning. Often I did not see my friend for days or a week. Then my friend would appear. But I was forbidden to look at his face. When my friend came into my life, I am not certain. Marishka came into my life when I was in 8th grade and so it was earlier than that time 
Marishka came from a house which was one of the ugly houses down the hill. Not just one family lived in the house, but several families, for it was a rental, as my mother said. These were people who lived down the hill, as my mother said. They were not people who lived on the hill as we did. Yet, children played there, played and shouted and laughed here at the foot of Prospect Hill, which was so very different from the crest of Prospect Hill where my family had lived for decades. Because of the steep hill, a flight of wooden steps led down from the crude porch at the rear of Marishka's house to the rutted ground 10 or 15 feet below. But no one walked here much. The ground was covered in debris, even raw garbage. Marishka had fallen from the porch railing, where someone had carelessly set her. I thought this must have happened. Unless Marishka had been tossed from the porch by someone who was tired of her rouge cheeks, rosebud mouth, and her colorful peasant costume. A friend said eagerly, She is our prize. No one else can claim her now. My friend said, Lift her and put your hand over her mouth. My friend said, Inside your jacket. Walk quickly. Don't run. Take the back way. Marishka was heavier than you would think. A ceramic doll is a heavy doll. Marishka's arms and legs are awkwardly spread. By force, I managed to subdue them. I could not hide Marishka in my room where she could be found by my mother or our housekeeper. I could not hide Marishka anywhere in the house, though it was a large house with three stories and many of its rooms were shut off. So I bought her to the carriage house, which was used as a garage for my parents' vehicles and as a place for storage and where I believed the beautiful ceramic doll would be safe, wrapped in canvas many times and placed in one of the horse stalls in the cobwebby chateau. I learned about the horse stalls from my grandfather. My father's grandfather had been mayor of the capital city six miles to the south which was now a racially troubled city with a high crime rate. After my father's grandfather was no longer mayor, he had moved his family to Prospect Hill. In this suburb of mostly white people beside the Delaware River, in those days there had been horses in the carriage house, in four stalls at the back, and still you could smell the animals. A faint odor of dried manure, horse sweat, hay. Here, I knew that Marishka would be safe. I would come to visit her when I wished. And Marishka would always, always be there, where I had left her, wrapped in canvas for safekeeping. When my friend did not come to me, I was very lonely. But if there had been horses in the stable, as there had been during my great-grandfather's time, I would not have been so lonely. My parents had warned me not to play in the carriage house. The roof leaked badly and was partly rotted. There was a second floor that sagged in the middle, as if the boards had become rubbery. Only the front part of the carriage house was used now for my parents' vehicles and the rest was filled with abandoned things, furniture, tires and a broken tricycle of mine, a baby buggy, cardboard boxes, nothing of use any longer. But nothing was thrown away. Hornets built their nests beneath the roof. The buzzing was peaceful if the hornets were not disturbed. No one had told me exactly, but I knew. My father's family had been well-to-do until early 1960s. Then the family business had gone into decline. 
Bitterly, my father spoke of overseas competitions. Still, the house on Prospect Hill was one of the old, large houses envied by others. There were real estate investments that continued to yield income and my father was an accountant for a prosperous business of which he spoke with some pride. My father was not a distinguished man or in any way unusual except for living in one of the large houses of Prospect Hill, which he had inherited from his father. I thought that my father might have loved me more if he had been more successful. What a terrible thing! Now it's coming here? The terrible thing was not a robbery or a burglary or an arson set fire or a shooting murder, but a little girl missing here in our suburban town and not in the capital city six miles to the south. The news was in all the papers and TV and radio. Such excitement, it was like dropping a lighted match into dried hay. You could not guess what would erupt from such a small act. At our school, we were called into assembly. An announcement made by the principal and a police officer in a uniform. The little girl who was missing was in fourth grade and lived on Catamount Street. And we were warned not to speak with strangers or go anywhere with strangers. And if any strangers approached us to run away as quickly as possible and notify our parents or our teachers or Mrs. Rickett, who was our principal. At the same time, it was suspected that the little girl who had disappeared had been kidnapped by her own father who lived in New Town. The father was arrested and questioned but claimed to know nothing about his daughter. For days, there was news of the missing girl. Then, news of the missing girl faded, then ceased. Once a child is gone, she will not return. That was a truth we would learn in middle school. Marishka was safe in her hiding place, in the farthest horse stall, in the old stable, at the rear of the carriage house, behind our house, where no one would ever look. It was not my fault that my cousin Amy went away and left me. All your life, you yearn to return to what has been. You yearn to return to those who you have lost. You will do terrible things to return, which no one else can understand. The second found dawn was not until I was in the ninth grade. Annie was a pretty-faced girl doll, with skin like real skin to touch except some of the dye had begun to wear off and you could see the grey rubber beneath which was silvery and ugly. Annie was a small doll, not so large and heavy as Marishka. She wore a cowgirl costume with a velvet skirt, a shiny buckled belt, a shirt with little velvet vest and a little black tie and on her feet were cowboy boots. She had been partly broken. One of her arms was dislocated and turned too easily in its shoulder socket. And her red orange curly hair had come out in patches to reveal the rubber scalp beneath. What was pretty about Annie was the soft blue violet marble eyes and the freckles on her face that made you want to smile. Her eyes like baby Emily's eyes, shut when you leaned her backward and open when you leaned her forward. My friend had seen Annie first, in the park near my house, beyond the playground where children shouted and laughed swinging, on the swings there was a little group of picnic tables and beneath one of the tables in which initials had been carved and cut, the cowgirl doll lay on the ground, on her back. Here! Hurry! My friend shoved me forward, my friend's hard hand on my back. What is this beneath the picnic table? I was excited. 
I stooped to see a doll, a cowgirl doll, abandoned. Picnic debris had been dumped onto the ground. Soda bottles, food packages, stubs of cigarettes. It was very cruel that the cowgirl doll with a freckled face and red orange hair should be abandoned here. Her arms were outstretched. Her legs were at odd angles to her body and to each other. Because she had been dropped on her back, her eyes were partly closed, but you could see the glassy glisten beneath of surprise and alarm. Help me! Don't leave me! Distinctly, we heard this plea of Annie's. My friend and me. Her voice was whispery and small. Her chipped scarlet lips scarcely moved. Inside my hooded jacket, I bore Annie to safety. My friend guided me from the park by an obscure route. My friend walked before me to see if the way was clear. It was a quarter mile to the carriage house and to the shadowy horse stall at the end. In this way, in a trance of amazement, cowgirl Annie, the second found doll, was brought home. By this time, the little fourth grade girl who had lived on Catamount Street was rarely spoken of. For she had gone away and would not return. And this new girl who has gone missing from Prospect Heights Park, when her older sister and brother, who were supposed to be watching her at the swings, had been distracted by friends. She too had gone away and would not be returning. Another time, much alarm was raised at our school, though the missing girl was a third grader at another school, though we had heard the warnings about strangers many times by now, by ninth grade. The uniformed police officer who spoke to us from the auditorium stage reassured us that whoever took this child will be found. But these two familiar were the words. Some of us were smiling to hear them. In the park that afternoon, there had been solitary men, always in a park near a playground, there are solitary men. And some of these men have criminal records. And these were taken into custody by the police and questioned. But we knew the little girl would never be found. Now, I was no longer taunted by the older boys on the school bus, for I was not one of the younger children. In my eyes, such hatred blazed for these boys that they learned to avoid me. I learned that to be respected, you had to be steely calm and still, or you had to be reckless. You could not show weakness. You could not be nice. You would be ground beneath the boots of someone strong like a beetle. But now the second of the found dolls had come into my life. I did not care what these boys thought of me or anyone else except my friend. I found my second doll when I was 14. Not soon, for my friend cautioned me against recklessness. Not soon, but within two years, the third of the found dolls entered my life. Then after 11 months, a fourth found doll. These were not local dolls. These were dolls discovered miles from Prospect Hill in other towns. For now, I had a driver's license. I had the use of my mother's car. At school, I was a quiet student. But my teachers seemed to like me. And my grades were usually high. At home, I was quiet in a way that maddened my father for it seemed to him sullen and rebellious. I had a habit of grunting instead of talking or mumbling under my breath. I had a habit of not looking at any adult, including my parents, for it was easier that way. My friend did not want me to look at him. My friend understood the effort such looks require. You can look into a doll's eyes without fear 
of the doll seeing into your soul in a way hostile to you. But you can't be so careless looking at anyone else. And this too maddened my father, that I would not meet his gaze. I was disrespectful. My father said, I will send him into the army, not to college. They will straighten him out of there. My mother pleaded, Robbie should see a therapist. I told you, please let me take him to a therapist. So it happened. On the day of my 18th birthday, I had an appointment with Dr. G, a therapist whose speciality was troubled adolescence. I sat in a chair facing Dr. G, in a trance of fear and dislike, not raising my eyes to her, but I was staring at the floor at her feet. Dr. G's office was sparsely furnished. Dr. G did not sit behind the desk, but in a comfortable chair, so that I could see her legs, which were the legs of a stout middle-aged woman. And I thought, how much preferable it was at school where our teachers sat behind desks so that you could only see the top of their body mostly and not their legs. It was easy to think of them as big dolls that way, whose jaw hinges always were moving. Dr. G asked me to sit in a chair facing her, about five feet from her, and this too was a comfortable chair though I did not feel comfortable in it and knew that I must be alert. Robbie, talk to me please. Your mother has said that your grades are very good. You don't have trouble at school communicating, evidently, but at home, the kindlier the woman was, the less I trusted her. The more intensely she looked at my face, the less inclined I was to raise my eyes to her. My friend had cautioned, don't trust, not for an instant, you will be finished. It was then I noticed a doll in a chair on the farther side of the room. Her head was large for her body and her face seemed to glow or glare with an arrogant sort of beauty and her thick lashed eyes were fixed upon me. Dr. G's clients included young children, I have been told. Teenagers, children, troubled. Though the office was sparsely furnished, yet there were a number of dolls of varying size and types, each distinctive and unusual. Barely I could hear the therapist's voice, which was warm, friendly and kind. So powerful was the doll's hold upon me. You're admiring my antique Dresden doll? It's dated 1841 and is in quite good condition. It's made of wood with a painted face. The colours have scarcely faded. Dr. G was clearly hoping that I would react to this information. But I sat silent, frowning. I would not smile, as others had smiled in my place, nor would I ask some polite but silly questions. As a boy, I could not be expected to care about dolls. Staring at the doll who stared at me with marble eyes, that reminded me of baby Emily's eyes. In those eyes, a subtle sign of recognition. It was exciting. The Dresden doll did seem to know me. Because of the therapist's presence, however, the Dresden doll was not in the least bit afraid of me. She was a beautiful doll though, made of wood, and unlike any of my found dolls. At first, you thought she had dark wavy hair. Then you saw that the hair was just wood, painted dark brown. Some of my very young clients prefer to talk to a doll than to me, Mrs. G said. But I don't suppose that's the case with you, Robbie. I shook my head no. It was not the case with Robbie. Elsewhere in the therapist's office were smaller dolls. On a shelf 
was a gaily painted Russian doll. Russian doll, which I knew had another smaller doll inside it, and another smaller doll within that doll. I did not like these Russian dolls. That made me feel slightly sick. I thought of how a woman carries a baby inside her, and how terrifying it would be if that baby carried another baby inside it. There were rag dolls arranged on a shelf like puppets. There were little music boxes covered in seashells and mother of pearl, and there were Japanese fans and animal carved of wood. Though Dr. G had furnished her office fairly. and the colors of the furniture and of the carpet on the floor were dull dull colors that could not excite any emotion as dr g wore dull dull colored and shapeless clothing that could not excite any emotion yet these collectors items suggested another more complex and secret side of dr g tell me Why you find it so difficult to talk to your parents, Robbie? Your mother has said, in a quite stubborn woman voice, Dr. G spoke, because there is nothing to say, because my real life is elsewhere, where no one can follow. I did not like many people, especially I did not like adults who wanted to help me. But I think I liked Dr. G. I wanted to help Dr. G establish a diagnosis of what was wrong with me so that my parents would be satisfied and leave me alone. Yet I could not think how to help her for I could not tell her the secrets closest to my heart. Badly I wanted to examine the Dresden doll with the painted face. Badly I wanted to take the Dresden doll home with me. In all I would see Dr. G approximately 12 times over the course of 5 or 6 months. I was not a good client, I think. I never opened up to Dr. G as troubled people do to their therapist in movies or TV. Never during these visits did I reveal anything significant to Dr. G. But I was connected by the Dresden doll who stared at me boldly through the full 15 minute session. The Dresden doll was not afraid of me because she was protected by Dr. G who never left the office and never left us alone together. You cannot touch me. Not me. I belong to her. You did not find me. I was always here and I will be here when you are not here. Such a look came into my face of longing and anger. Dr. G broke off whatever she was saying to exclaim, "Robbie, what are you thinking? Did something come into your mind just now? Something coming into my mind like a maddened hornet, a paper plane, a nudge in the rib?" Quietly, I shook my head no, lowering my gaze to stare at a spot on the carpet. As my friend had warned, never make eye contact. You know better. This was so. I had made a mistake, but it was not a fatal mistake, for no one knew except the Dresden doll. She was only a doll. I thought something made of wood. She could not be a found doll, for I could never touch her, never bring her to the carriage house for safekeeping among her sister dolls. Is something distracting you, Bobby? Is it something in this room? Shook my head. No. Would you be more comfortable if we moved to another room? Shook my head. No. Then, at our next meeting, which would be our last meeting, I was shocked to see that the Dresden doll had been removed from the white wicker rocking chair. In her place was an embroidered pillow. I said nothing, of course. my face locked into its frozen expression and would not betray me i think you might be more comfortable now ravi dr g spoke gently i hated this homely graceless female now 
that she had sensed the whole of the Dresden all over me. She alone, of all the world, might guess of my fascination with found dolls. I hated her and I feared her, that suddenly I might lose control. I might begin to shout at her, demanding to see the Dresden doll again. Or I might burst into tears, confessing to her that I had stolen the found dolls that were hidden in the carriage house. It is a terrible thing to feel that you might break down. You might utter a confession that could not be retrieved. And so I did not speak at all. My throat shut tight. Dr. G asked her usual picky little friendly seeming questions, to which I could not reply. And after some minutes of awkward silence on my part, Dr. G handed me a notebook and a pen and suggested that I write out my thoughts if I could not speak to her. I took the notebook from her and with a smile of a shy but determined boy, I wrote goodbye and handed it back to her. Already I was on my feet. Already I was gone. After high school, it was decided that I would postpone college. My grades had been high, especially in physics and calculus. And at graduation, my name had been asterisked in the commencement program to indicate the highest distinction. But I had not gotten around to apply for any college or university. My teachers and my school guidance counsellor were perplexed by this decision, but my mother understood to a degree, for my father had left us from the house on Prospect Hill, and you might think that a concerned son would not leave his mother alone in such a large house at such a time. Only I knew I could not leave my found dolls. I could not risk stranger finding them. The possibility of the found dolls being discovered was too terrible to consider. Often when I could not sleep, I took a flashlight and went out into the carriage house. By moonlight, the carriage house seemed to float like a ghost ship on a dark sea, and all was still except for the cries of nocturnal birds and, in summer, sound of nocturnal insects buzzing and humming like insidious thoughts. The found dolls lay quiet in their makeshift cribs on plywood and hay. They had been placed side by side like sisters, though each doll was quite distinct from the other and might have made a claim of being the most beautiful. Mariska, Annie, Valerie, Evangeline, Barbie. Barbie was one of that notorious breed, Barbie dolls. In this case, Bright Barbie. For the angelic blonde girl doll wore a white silk gown that shimmered, shook when you lifted her, and on her flawless head a lace veil. Her figure was not a child's figure, but that of a miniature but mature woman with pronounced breasts straining against the bodies of the wedding dress, a ridiculously narrow waist and shapely hips. My friend had observed one of these will do. We should give Barbie a chance. Barbie had given me the most difficulty, in fact. You would not think that a doll so small and weighing so little could scream so loud and that her fingernails shaped and polished and very sharp could inflict such damage on my bare forearm. If she does not obey, you can chop her into pieces. Tell her she is on a trial for her life. In her makeshift crib of plywood and hay, Barbie lay motionless, as if in a trance of great surprise and great loathing. Not ever would Barbie cast a sidelong glance at her sister doll beside her, a soft, boneless, clothed doll with a pale, pretty face and a little tiara on her platinum blonde curls sparkling with tiny rhinestones. Evangeline had come from Juniper Court, a trailer village on the outskirts of her town, hardly protesting Evangeline had come with me 
at my friend's suggestion, for she was a doll lacking a substantial body. Her head was made of some synthetic material like plastic or a combination of plastic and serum, but her body was boneless like a sock puppet. She could not put up much of a struggle and seemed almost to fall before me in a swoon of rejection, as a sock puppet might do for whom the only possible life is generated by another's antique hand. No one had searched for Evangeline. It was believed that Evangeline was a runaway like other children in her family and in Juniper Court. When I left the dolls, I covered them beneath a khaki-coloured canvas, neatly. This khaki-coloured canvas was the cleanest covering I could find in the carriage house. Many items of furniture and other abandoned and forgotten things in the carriage house were covered with a piece of canvas that was soiled and discoloured. But the covering for the found dolls was reasonably clean. I would have drawn quilts over them to keep them warm, but I was worried that someone would notice and become suspicious. No one ever came into this part of the carriage house, not for years. But I had an irrational fear that someone might come into the carriage house and discover my found dolls. My friend said, they are happy here, they are at peace here, this is the best that they have been treated in their short tragic lives. One night, not long after I had stopped seeing Dr. G, I heard a sound at the entrance to the stable, like a footfall, and shone my light there, thinking in dismay, Mother, I will have to kill her. But there was no one there, and when I returned to the house, it was darkened as before. I was relieved, I think for it would not be an easy or pleasant matter to subdue Cyrus and suffocate mother, so much larger than any of the found dolls. Most nights, mother would sleep deeply. I think mother was heavily medicated. Sometimes, I stood in the doorway of mother's room, seeing her motionless mannequin figure by moonlight beneath the bedcloth of a larger canopied bed and listening to her rhythmic breathing, which sometimes shaded into a soft snoring that was a comfort for me. For when mother was awake and in my presence, always she was aware of me and looking at me. Always she was addressing me or asking me a question, waiting for me to reply. But I had no reply for her. Though I only murmured or grunted responses and avoided looking at mother's face, mother was never discouraged and continued to chatter in my presence as if she were thinking aloud and yet at the same time addressing me. My friend laid a sympathetic hand on my shoulder. It was the first time that my friend had appeared inside my house. You know that it would be better, Robbie if the women were silenced. But this is not a task for the weak and cowardly. How strange this was. Weak and cowardly was not a phrase my friend had ever spoken before. But it was a phrase that my father had sometimes used in a voice of mockery. There was a sixth found door, as it turned out a disappointing one but I could not have guessed so beforehand. Till I kept Trixie with the others. Though sometimes I did not remove the canvas from her crib, for her sour curdled milk part face and reproachful green marble eyes were discomforting to me. And her cheap, sleazy, silly costume, a low cut sequence top that showed the cleavage of her breasts and a frilly, frothy ballerina skirt in matching turquoise and spike-heeled little shoes were frankly embarrassing. No more of Trixie. I will draw the khaki-covered canvas over Trixie. Voila, as my friend says. And seventh pound doll, a boy doll. His name was an exotic name, Bharata. He had taffy-coloured skin 
of the finest rubber that so resembled human flesh. You shivered as your fingertips caressed his face and felt a rush of warmth. His eyes were not glassy brown, but a warm chocolate brown, and thick lashed, beautiful as any girl's eyes. Bharata wore chino shorts, a sky blue t shirt, blue sneakers on his small feet, and no socks. His legs were well formed, with a look of small muscle more defined than his sister doll's legs. The palm of his hand were light coloured than the rest of his body. I was fascinated by this. Did people of colour normally have palms lighter than the rest of their body? I had not ever known any people of colour. No one in our family did, my friend said. You see, Robbie, you were prejudiced against boys. Now, you have a surprise in store. Bharata was one of the larger dolls with a sweetly pretty boy face and very black curly hair. His black eyelashes swept against his cheeks, which appeared to be lightly rouged. You could not have told if Bharata's mouth was a boy's mouth or a girl's. Bharata was the only doll who tried to speak in actual words. Not merely soft speaking sounds, Bharata's mouth moved and I leaned to him to listen, but heard only what sounded like, where, where is, who, who are you, I don't want to be, don't, don't want to be here. Other found dolls might have exhibited some jealousy or envy of my taffy skinned found boy doll, but they disguised their emotion well, for they knew their place and did not wish to offend me who was their dawn master. It was my friend who had told me, One day, Robbie, you are the dawn master. You must never surrender your authority. Mother said, We have no choice, really. This house is so large. Most of the rooms are shut off and unheated. A house of this size was meant for a large family. And now, there is only us. Only us was hurtful to me to hear, as if only us were an admission of such shameful defeat, it had to be murmured, near inaudibly. So what do you mean, mother? Do you want to sell the house? I could barely hear my mother's reasonable voice asking me if I would call a realtor and if I would oversee the selling of the house. It's a profound decision. It's a profound step in our lives, but I think we have no choice. The property taxes alone are... It was so. Property taxes were rising. Taxes of all sorts were rising in New Jersey. Now, there is no one in our family going to public school. It seems a shame to pay for the public education. My sister was showing me a brochure of condominiums on the river. Two and three bedroom, very modern and stylish. Mother chatted nervously, excitedly. Mother would not expect me to react to her suggestion in any empathic way, but that was not Robbie's nature. Father had not only left the old Victorian house on Prospect Hill, but also had dissociated himself from it entirely. In the divorce settlement, he had signed over the property to my mother. There were to be no alimony payments for my mother as she had a small income from investment she inherited. Mother sometimes wept but more often expressed relief. Your father has gone. Since the separation several years before, father and I rarely saw each other. Father did not like to return to our suburban town. It was an effort for him, as he made clear, to attend my high school graduation and to avoid my mother and her relatives. And I did not like to leave our suburban town, and so we exchanged emails occasionally and less frequently spoke on the phone. It is the easiest tie to break, my friend consoled me, the tie that was badly torn to begin with. Where time seemed to have virtually stopped for my mother, 
who continues to see a small circle of women friends, several of them widows and older female relatives over the year, time moved rapidly for me. I was not unhappy, though you would have to call me reclusive. I did not consider myself a dropout from the society or a failure in the way that my father considered himself a failure and that had poisoned his life. My relationships with the world were primarily through the internet, where I had established a website under the name The Doll Master, through which I would make many acquaintances. Here, I posted shadowy, oblique and poetic photographs of found dolls, images too dark and uncertain to be identified. Though the visitors to the site found them haunting, eerie, makes me want to see more time. My website visitors have become faithful correspondents and my emails take up a large part of my life. For it is thrilling for me, as I believe it has to be for them. Mother believes that I have contacted a real estate agent in town and have met with her. Mother believes that the house is listed tastefully with no ugly sign at the foot of our lawn and only serious home seekers who can afford the property considered. But mother does not force me with question about the house sale. For mother would rather not think of where we would live if the house were really sold and what our circumstances would be. And I am comforting to mother by saying, with a smile, one step at a time mother, the real estate market is flat now. We might not have any serious interest until spring. Yet that domestic comfort has come to an abrupt end. My friend has abandoned me, I think, for my friend has no advice to give me now. It was the occasion of a new found doll. I had not brought a found doll back to the carriage house for 13 months, which I believed was a sign of fortitude and character for I could not be quite impulsive or reckless, rather over-attentive, I think. For when I brought my new-found doll to the carriage house and lay her in her little crib beside the others, I lingered too long, in a state of infatuation. I lost track of time, as dusk shaded into night, and I gazed at little farmer girl in the beam of my flashlight and marvelled at her uniqueness. Of all my dolls, with the possible exception of the rag doll Evangeline, who lacked a substantial body, this doll was soft, hardly more than fabric with a hard doll head, yet strangely appealing. Not beautiful, not enough pretty, but winning, for when I washed away the grime on little farmer girl's face, she was relieved as a sweet homely cousin sort of girl, with stiff pigtails, a funny mouth, wide unblinking marble eyes, her body was made of cloth, on which some of the stuffing had leaked out. She wore denim bib overalls and a red pleat shirt beneath, and on her skinny legs red tights, and on her tiny feet boots. Her costume was dirty, but yet colourful for she had not been discarded for long, it seemed. I had pulled little farmer girl out of the trash behind our suburban train station, where there is an old unused railroad yard with a fence around it. No one comes there, though passengers waiting the train are gathered on the platform only a quarter mile away, except children sometimes or runaways. It was plausible to think that little farmer girl was a runaway whose difficult life had brought her to this place and to my discovery of her in the peaceful interim between the trains when the depot is virtually deserted. It was a game of kidnap, I decided, since little farmer girl was so soft-bodied there was no effort involved in lifting her holding her and carrying her beneath my hooded jacket. When she struggled 
I tied her wrist and ankles and stuffed a rag in her mouth so that her cries were muffled and could not be heard by anyone farther than six feet away. No effort then to place little farmer girl in the trunk of the station wagon and to drive slowly back to the top of Prospect Hill. Why little farmer girl exerted such a spell over me is a mystery. But I suppose, as my friend would say with a laugh, Robbie, you are so funny. Each of your dolls was enthralling to you, Kinishin. I thought that too. But when I began taking pictures of little farmer girl that very night to record more consciously that I had the others before the inevitable incursion of time, decomposition and decay intervened. My experience was that flash photos were particularly effective in these circumstances as more poetic and artistic than photographs taken by day even in the shadowy interior of the store. Robbie? Is that you? Why are you here, Robbie? What are you doing? So absorbed had I been squatting over little farmer girl, I hadn't heard mother approach the rear of the carriage house. Too late. I saw the grouping beam of her flashlight moving upon me and upon the row of found dolls on the floor of the stall that occupied now most of the stall. Robbie, what is in the crude light of mother's flashlight? The found dolls were revealed as small skeletons with rags of clothing and wisps of hair on their battered skulls. Their faces were skull faces with mirthless grin and eyeless sockets. Their own arms were spread as for an embrace. This was mother's true light, not the light of the door master. Quickly, I took the flashlight from mother's shaking hand. Quickly, I comforted her, telling her that these were sculptures that I had done, but had not wanted to show anyone. Sculptures? Here?